Hi, I'm Dr. Harry, CEO of the Wheatbelt Health Network. We've been funded through the ILC grants to produce a program called Disability Inclusion in Schools and Communities. Now, as part of that, we have the Leader Series interviews. These are interviews with people with a disability who've made it to a leadership position. It explores their challenges, their journeys, and the sorts of things that they might see which might produce a more inclusive community. Sit back and enjoy. Here are their stories. Great stuff. All right. Drizana, what would you say is your greatest strength? I feel that uh, the person I am, I think my strength would be that I say things as they are. I can tell people when they're right. I can tell people when they're incorrect. It's not always easy to do, but it's something that's inherent in me that I feel I have to be able to have a conversation with people and make sure that I can correct things that are not, not correct, but also to praise when things are done you know, correctly. Okay, thank you. Um, Josanna, what motivated you to um, take up disability advocacy? As a deaf person myself, we experience barriers every day. And I think as a strong person, I have a strong personality, I can't just leave those things for somebody else to deal with. I feel like I want to access the world. I want to participate. I want to understand what's going on. And that means that I have to advocate for others, but usually it's advocating for myself because if I can't access it, that generally means that other people can't access it either. So there's no choice really. It's not like I woke up and thought, oh, it'd really be nice to take on a job as an advocator. I advocate because I am an Australian citizen. I want to participate in the community. I want to know what's going on in Australia and around the world. Mm, fantastic, thank you. Uh, people with, with a disability are a big cohort of people who face domestic abuse and it often goes unreported. As an ambassador for Our Watch and Full Stop Foundation, what do you think about this issue? I think it's a serious issue that's not discussed enough. And it's true that there are so many instances of domestic violence, assault, physical assault against people with a disability. And the, the incidence of it is quite high, but the reporting doesn't match the a number of incidents of it occurring. And I think what people don't realise is that uh, people with a disability have a number of other barriers that they face in life. For example, if a deaf person might be thinking about advocating for an interpreter so they can access university, but then they also need to organise, uh, uh, you know, reporting a rape. But the people they're reporting to are not fluent in Auslan, then how do you report that? Mm. They might not understand the culture of the deaf person or their background. And that's the same for other people with a disability. So I think there's often a negative stigma. People often think, well, why would somebody want to hurt a person who's got a disability? Because often they're perceived as inferior. And I remember one story that I was told about a woman who was in a wheelchair. She had been with her husband for 10 years and he abused her repeatedly. She ended up being admitted to hospital with severe injuries. And that's when the uh, hospital finally intervened and they realised it was a case of domestic violence. So the husband was separated for, from her, the police became involved, and that was good. But when she was better, she went back home. And unfortunately, she had relied on the husband to look after her, to help her shower, to do those daily necessities. 
because she wasn't that independent on her own. But she didn't receive any uh, support or help after she was released from hospital. And so she got to the point where she was almost ready to call her husband and say, can you please come back home so you can help me do these things? She almost felt like she was prepared to put up with the abuse and the rape, etc., because she needed his assistance to help her for her daily hygiene. So that's an example where people think, oh, we've helped you resolve this issue. The domestic violence has stopped. But there are layers involved to these issues and to people's lives. The, the amount of support that they require for them to maintain their independence is not being provided. So I agree it's a serious topic, it's a really serious issue, but it's not discussed enough. Mm. And we know that awareness needs to be raised. Mm, thank you. Um, uh, is lack of awareness, training or support for carers uh, uh, an issue which results in abuse of people with disabilities? Often for people with a disability or for deaf people, they're not in a position of power uh, over their own lives, particularly for those with carers. I'm not saying that they're all bad, uh, and as a deaf person, I um, will tell people, you know, what I, what I disagree with, but I'm lucky and fortunate to have the skills and the knowledge to navigate life independently. But not many people are in the same position as me and able to navigate that. So yes, we absolutely need improved training. For example, the call centre, the people who take the calls from people who are calling up reporting domestic violence and rape, perhaps they need more training in counselling. You know, it's a very specialised area. So I agree we need to increase pretty much, yes, I agree, awareness for everybody that can be impacted. But unfortunately, the statistics are higher for people with a disability and for deaf people, because it goes unreported. For example, a woman with an intellectual disability is nine times, nine times out of ten, will be sexually assaulted. That's a scary statistic. 90% of women with an intellectual disability will be and have been sexually assaulted. Or not. Why are we not doing anything more about that? Why are we not protecting them more? So yes, the statistics are quite sad. That's a scary statistic that I was not aware of. Mm, thank you. Um, as an influencer of policy makers, how do you get other people to accept your ideas? How do you influence the world around you, Josana? I think it links back to what I've commented on about before about my strength and how I say things as they are. I don't, uh, or maybe that's why I became why I can't become a politician, because I'm not good at, you know, twisting things to make them sound better. I'm quite blunt. If it's a problem, it's a problem, and I'll say it as so. If it needs to be solved, it needs to be solved, and I'll say it so. I like to think that that's why I've made some, have had some success in my advocacy journey, because I'm not hiding anything. I'm showing the policy makers the reality and the consequences of their decisions or, you know, uh, linked to the lack of funding. So I can highlight those issues and the things that need to be fixed. So I'd like to think that because of who I am and my personality, that's why things um, have been successful. Hmm. Thank you. There are over 32 million deaf children in the world. How do you think schools and communities can be more inclusive of these people? I think the core of uh, anything that we do, we need to remember that everybody is a human being. Everybody has the same emotional needs and wants in life. So. We want to be full members of society. We want to participate in things that we enjoy. It would be lovely to live a life without hate or oppression or discrimination, regardless if they, people have a disability or if they're deaf. Everyone has the right to participate and you know enjoy life, to make friends, to uh, be involved in education. 
So I think that if we keep in mind how to respect one another, be more compassionate, to have a good and positive attitude, I think often we we look down on people and that has a devastating effect because you've already established your own limitations of what you think of a person, of what they you think they can and can't achieve. But really, the sky's the limit. We need to push back and we need to encourage these people to do whatever they want to do and be. Often the problem's not with those people, it's with us as a society with our own either intentional or unintentional biases. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, school children across our country learn a second language and often it's something like Italian or Greek. Do you think Auslan should be part of the curriculum instead? Well, I have some wonderful news. Auslan has actually been established and implemented as a national, in the national curriculum under the government. So that was in 2017. So it's wonderful to get the recognition and support and the funding by the Australian government to provide Auslan as a LOAT. So it's available in two language pathways. So as an L1, which is a, as a first language learner, so that's people like me, for example, who have grown up with Auslan as my first language, but also as an L2 or as a second language. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's learning Auslan as their second language or maybe their third or their fourth language. So that's available for as a foundation which is basically from kindy all the way up to year 10. For year 11 and year 12, it's a responsibility of the state because it's part of the exam. exam. Oh, okay. But in WA, we've already developed our year 11 and year 12 program. So we actually have a foundation to year 12 in WA. So hopefully, because of that, um, as an official part of the Australian curriculum, it means that the language will be rolled out uh, further. Mm. Uh, it's being taught by um, native Auslan users, and that will in turn increase the acceptance and understanding and the awareness of Auslan. Because it's not only that, they're teaching linguistics, they're teaching history, colonisation of deaf people, oppression, everything we need to know about the language and its the community uses of it, because the language doesn't stand alone. It has all of these other peripheral things that make the language part of that community. So it's exciting times ahead, really. Mm, oh, it is indeed. Um, Josiah, what would your advice be to organisations uh, for them to be more inclusive? I think every organisation and company should be hiring people with a disability, deaf people, to consult with them and being paid for it, not free consultation, to consult on policies, recruitment. For example, I've just been training uh, with the local council, I've done a number of uh, training uh, meetings, uh, working with the HR team, on how to make sure they have a fair process for people with a disability or for deaf people who apply for jobs. Or, if they become an actual staff member, how do you make sure that that staff member is then um, an asset to the business, providing that, you know, matching their skills and ability? Not just because it's nice to give them a job, it's because they're actually qualified for that position. So really, there's that, but also companies and organisations need to keep an open mind. I know so many organisations will receive a CV, and when they look at it and see that it's got deaf or that the person has a disability, mm. they, they panic. They don't know what to do. Mm. I think just talk to that person. That person has already navigated what they need to do. It's their life, 24-7. They know what works. They know what doesn't. So I think people need to let go of their own fears and say, okay, let's talk to the person. They know have the solutions. I don't need to be an expert, but I need to work with that person. It's actually a lot easier than people make it out to be. Mm, mm. That's my belief. 
Yeah, so it's a mental barrier, really? Yes, yeah. yes. If you remove that, then obviously number one, you need to check that they're qualified for the yeah. job. And if they are, you don't want to get somebody just as a tokenistic no. you know, reaction. And then secondly, there are so many solutions out there, and it depends on the individual person's needs. For example, now that we have NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I'm assuming, I haven't actually been able to access that yet, but I'm assuming that that will provide more opportunities for technological adaptations, Auslan interpreters, captioning, whatever that individual person's requirements are. So I'm assuming that this will lift, lift them to be able to become, uh, you know, a functioning member of that organisation. Mm. That's the hope. Yeah. The hope. Oh, indeed it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Drizani, you've got many accomplishments um, uh, and awards under your belt. Is there one that you are most proud of? <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Uh, I'd probably have to say the Young Australian of the Year mm. Award. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for that award, I wouldn't be where I am at in life mm. currently. Yes, it gives me a reputation and a profile, but it's never been about me. It's about the deaf community, about the deaf people, mm. and hopefully for people with a disability as well. It's a spotlight on the community that we've needed for so long. Mm. So anything and everything that I do is about increasing the positivity, the understanding of the language, of the people, of the culture, our community. So I'm really proud about that because I feel like it has opened so many doors. Mm. I've met some amazing people. I've had some tough times as well as a result of it, but I've also had some amazing times and opportunities to be involved in projects, uh, yeah, so I think the future has brightened because of that award and giving that type of recognition to the deaf community and the language. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the language and the community that has been behind me this entire time for my entire life. Yeah, thank you. Um, what would you say has been the best moment of your life? Oh. Okay, putting awards aside, the best moment. I think probably meeting slash marrying my husband. I always say he's my co-advocate. I'm very fortunate to have found someone who is my equal, if not more. He is incredibly passionate about human rights and advocacy. So we're often supporting each other in our journeys. We've uh, also faced some um, tough times because we've been living long distance from each other. You know, we've been in America and Canada and separated from each other. But we have maintained uh, our friendship, our relationship, because we share the same values, the same goals. So I think the best moment was meeting and marrying him because that has really cemented what our relationship has been about. That's lovely, thank you. Drizana, what would, say, what would you say has been the worst moment in your life? I wouldn't say there's been only one, unfortunately. There have been several, but Instead of describing uh, situations, I'd like to talk about the, the overview of why the, those things have happened. Unfortunately, we live in a world where, well, in, particularly in Australia, where we have a strong culture of um, tall poppy syndrome. Mm. So I found that as um, being a young deaf woman, I often experience instances of being oppressed or discriminated against and being pulled down within my community, um, outside of my community, by hearing people. I have experienced 
threats by uh, big media companies because I've told them off about uh, accessibility issues. I have received uh, threats by a group of people who, for whatever reason, don't like me. So I've experienced more than than what I would ever want anybody else to have to go through. Some of those experiences happened when I was only 21. I'd just become Young Australian of the Year. And it was overwhelming to deal with. You know, there was this positivity and the excitement. But it's, I also experienced a lot of anger and hate and resistance. So it was very difficult for me to uh, navigate through that. But at the same time, I like to think that now that I've gotten a little bit older, a little bit wiser, those experiences have supported me in really uh, understanding who I am and ensuring that I stick to my values. Because I can't please everyone. Everyone has their own opinion, their own agenda. I live this 24-7. I will say it as it is. I don't need best friends. I need this world to be better. I need the world, this world to be better for me and for other people, for everybody. So I think I've become to, to accept that there are people who don't like me, but that's because I tell the truth. Mm. I don't like lies, I don't like trying to please people, I don't like to try and do that to, in order to get them to be my friends. I want to see social justice, I want to see social change. So there are bad moments, bad instances, but they've also helped me to learn mm. through the years. Thank you.